and uh, welcome. I'm Polly Toynbee. I write for The Guardian. I have a special uh, attachment to Chatham House. My grandfather, Arnold Toynbee, worked here for very, very many years. And also particularly relevant to what we're talking about today, he was at the Paris Peace Conference uh, and was appalled by the Treaty of Versailles and came away from it deeply disillusioned and depressed. He was a young aide at the time. So um, it has a special resonance as here we are, 100 years or almost to the end of the First World War and Paris Peace Conference the next year. And we have a very good panel to discuss preventing another world war. Uh, we have uh, Salika Duxworth Lawton, who is Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Uh, Santanu Das, who is a reader in English literature from King's College, London. And uh, Jonathan Pohl, who is uh, CEO of Intermediate uh, chief, and was chief, exec, uh, chief of staff to Prime Minister Tony Blair from 95 to 2007. And Peter Apps, who is global affairs columnist for Reuters, um, Future of War Fellow, New America, Executive Director of the Project for the Study of the 21st Century. Uh, we're going to start with each of them taking whatever aspect they like about this enormous subject. Um, I think those of us who were brought up under a, a cloud of believing that nuclear holocaust was going to happen at any moment, which was very much my background, wondering whether we are in more dangerous times or less dangerous times as things stand. And I hope we will get some clarity from our speakers. Uh, we're going to start with Salika, who's going to begin. Thank you. I was asked to talk about lessons of the World War I Versailles Treaty and 14 points for this modern limited war environment. And I wanted to talk about how some things will stay the same, some things will change, and some things will boggle us all entirely. So the things that will stay the same include nationalism and the nation state, because every time we think the nation state has died, it roars back to life with a vengeance. Ideology, and for my country, the United States, the idea in war that we can substitute technology for the boots on the ground. This is an idea that has backfired on us many times, and yet we still like it because the American public likes it. So if you look at the Korean conflict, the Vietnamese conflict, and the conflicts we have today, many of our problems have stemmed from that idea. The idea of re religious extremism, religious dominionism, whether I'm talking about Christian extremism in the US or Islamic extremism in other places or other forms of extremism as we are seeing um, in Myanmar. And finally, one thing that stays the same is no matter how much a battlefield changes, somehow we always wind up with trenches and tunnels. Ask the Israelis, um, would you believe that in 2018, they would be chasing down tunnels. Um, there is an American, there is a human impulse to fortifications. Now, imperial overstretch is also something that stays the same. And World War I saw imperial overstretch. And especially for the UK, the difficulty of defending a far-flung empire. And this is something that we are definitely seeing today. Um, economic and physical destruction causes instability. Just as the Versailles Treaty wrecked economic destruction on the German uh, state, and economic destruction that is one of the reasons for the rise of Hitler and the rise of authoritarianism. We see that kind of economic and physical destruction today and the power vacuums that come from it. The Iraq II, which is how we refer to the modern Iraq war in the US, is an example of such a power vacuum. But there are things that will change. 
And one of the things as a historian I like to talk about is the fact that our perceptions and our assumptions are key. Our perceptions in many ways are more important than the reality on the ground. And that idea of perception leads us into perhaps the most dangerous way that the face of battle is going to change. Technology is going to change the face of battle in ways that we do not want to see. We already are seeing conflicts where there is no front and there is no rear. Modern nation states like the US, the UK, France, Germany, want a Clausewitzian world with two armies on a field, combatants in uniforms. That world may be over. I would posit it's going to be far more rare in the future. And one of the big lessons of the 20th century is that asymmetrical warfare will probably be more common. Today, we stand in a cyber war, at least where I am in the United States. And yet, many of my fellow Americans do not understand that we are in a conflict, do not recognize that there is a battlefield because they don't see tanks and they don't see soldiers. And that cyber war, um, which is new to us, which has weaponized our culture, which has weaponized our protected speech against us, which uses the United States media's template for conflict as a way to create disunity and subversion um, is a new battlefront and is a battlefront that we did not envision when the internet arrived on the scene. War is moving, it always does come back to Clausewitz, but it's moving in a more Sun Tzuian way. Subversion is a face of battle that the United States, the UK, and the EU will have to face. And subversion has changed, although the principles of subversion stay the same. To weaponize the biases and the weaknesses and the marginalized peoples of a culture against it are the keys to subversion. Marginalized peoples hold the key to stability in this new world. In a world of cyber war, we like to believe that the realm of the internet and the realm of in the real world is different. But as we can see, the trolls are moving out of the computer and they used cars at Charleston to kill a young woman. They carried tiki torches. Here, they have killed people as well. We can no longer draw that separation between the cyber world and the real world. There are a number of missed opportunities that we've had because we have looked at marginalized peoples and not recognized what they wanted or who they were. If you look at the Versailles Treaty, probably the most famous missed opportunity was not allowing Ho Chi Minh in and not taking seriously the wish of Indo-Chinese people for self-determination. Mistaking their alliances with communists for them being communists. Mistaking nationalism and ethnicity for ideology. Today, the key to dealing with terrorists and subversion in the US, the UK, and in the European Union lies in the US, the UK, and the European Union. Our countries face a critical choice. Will we continue to indulge supremacists and nationalists who attack our marginalized people and who turn those marginalized people into assets against us? Or will we choose integration? The US faced this in the 1960s in the fight for African American freedom and liberation. As colonies decolonized, 
They looked at the US and said, why should we join your side? People who look like us are not free in your country. And we had to choose integration. It is a choice that we will have to continue to make in this world about immigrants and refugees. Because immigrants and refugees are our best intelligence assets, are our best bulwark against subversion. Asymmetrical warfare will be the framework for the 21st century. Just as technology and mobility did not make war short on the Marne, war will be less decisive today. Dropping bombs from airplanes will not end a war. The days of Napoleonic warfare will be fewer and shorter. Assumptions about groups by race, assumptions about groups by technology will not be effective. And having overwhelming technology will not always be an advantage. In Iraq, we saw technology used against the US. Our cellular networks, our computers, when they're knocked offline, they work against us. When people hack into them, they can now gain our information more easily when, than when that information was on paper. The biggest key, and this is where I'll leave you, to this new century is respecting our peoples and respecting opposing forces. Clausewitz and Sun Tzu argued that you had to respect the enemy and know the enemy. We face within our people a group that is willfully ignorant and proud of its anti-intellectualism proud of its refusal to look outward and proud of the fact that it does not want to look at the world. And I think that getting that group to understand the threats we face and what we have to do to give up their xenophobia is the greatest threat we face in this 21st century. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, now we're going to get quite a different window on the world from uh, a different discipline, and Santanu Das is going to talk Thank to you. Thank you. After Selika's kind of wonderfully encyclopedic kind of view, <laughs> I'll take you back again to the Versailles Treaty, and I'll start with a quotation. Woodrow Wilson in Paris was like an ant on a hot skillet. He didn't know what to do. He was surrounded by thieves like Clemenceau, Lloyd George, Makino, and Orlando. He had nothing except accounts of receiving certain amounts of territory and of reparations worth so much in gold. One day, a Reuters telegram read, President Wilson has finally agreed with Clemenceau's view that Germany be not allowed into the League of Nations. When I saw the words, finally agreed, I felt sorry for him for a long time. Poor Wilson. Any guess guesses who this quotation? This is, yes? No, no. <laughs> Close. It's Mao Zedong, the revolutionary <laughs> leader <laughs> and the future father of <clears throat> People's Republic of China. As a 25-year-old student in 1919, Mao Zedong here voices a tremendous sense of disappointment that was shared by the majority of the world's people and none kind of more than across Asia and Africa. And the sense of disappointment was in direct proportion to the sense of eu euphoria that swept across these lands in early 1918, particularly after Wilson's famous speech about self-determination. And I just quote kind of another line. This is kind of delivered on February 11th, kind of just 100 years back. National aspiration must be respected. People may now be dominated and governed only by their consent. And this was an elixir to these colonies thirsting for their independence. In the First World War, four million non-white men were recruited into the armies of different, the three European nation states and America. And most of them fought for just one reason, for a validation of their racial and political equality. And yet, 
at the end of the war. What they get is Amritsar, the Jallianabad massacre in India, where people were herded into this little space and gunned down. Or, for example, <clears throat> the race riots in London or Liverpool, or the lynchings in Arkansas, Chicago, and Washington, as one conflict bleeds into the other. Now we speak of the First World War, not just confined to 1914 to 18, but rather maybe 1908 to 1921. Now, one of the greatest legacies of this tsunami of centennial commemoration of the war that we are seeing for the last three years would be a greater recognition of this non-white and colonial contribution to the First World War. I think that after three years, the color of First World War memory is no longer just white. So there's a wonderful expansion there, but also I think there's a complete sanitization in the way the centennial commemoration is being kind of undertaken. The First World War is largely being reinvented as a grand stage to blow the trumpet of multiculturalism, ignoring many of the problems that seethe underneath. And I'll leap to another quotation, this from the former Tony minister, Saida Varsi, who in fact led the Commonwealth commemoration in, 19, in 2014. And this is from an article she wrote for The Telegraph in July 1914. It's, sorry, 2014. <laughs> it's just Freudian trying to send her back to 1914. <clears throat> what makes a hero? It's a question that has been on my mind recently, particularly as we celebrate armed forces day to day. For me, Anyone willing to risk their lives to serve their country is a hero. As we mark the centenary of the start of the First World War, the word has even greater meaning. Few of us realize that our Tommies were fighting side by side with Tariqs and Tajindas. These men felt a connection to Britain that was forged without having set a foot on these shores. With today's debate on Britishness, it's more important than ever before that young people of all faiths and backgrounds learn that their ancestors also fought for king and country a century back. I have an incredible sense of pride knowing that it was the same loyalty to Britain that inspired both my grandfathers to fight for Britain in the Second World War. And then she concludes, just as 100 years ago, our forefather had a duty to act, we have a duty to act today, to ensure that our sacrifices are remembered. Today, I urge every teacher, every parent, every faith and community leader to hear those remarkable and heroic stories. Now, what's in here is challenging the color of memory, which is all kind of well and good, but also what is being validated in the guise of colonial recovery of First World War memory is a narrow, nationalist, and warist culture. Those values of heroism, valor, sacrifice that led the path to the First World War. And it is being insidiously equated with Britishness. And again, predicated on a rhetoric that we historians kind of working on the First World War are too familiar. So in the name of colonial recovery, we seem to have gone back 100 years back because it is this, exactly these qualities that exploded amidst the mud and blood of the trenches. For example, if you think of Wilfred Owen, you know, if you think kind of the jolt of, kind of blood gushing out, you'd not, <coughs> say to your, you'd not say to people desperate for some ardent glory, the old lie, dulce decorum est pro patria mori. And even more, in, 19, in 2014, for Armistice Day, I was doing an interview, and then this kind of Sikh gentleman turned up, and I think he was kind of working for kind of Boris Johnson, the mayor of London then. And he and he's kind of began on the colonial front of the Sikh contribution to the First World War, which flowered without any break or mediating pause into this call for ethnic minorities to join the army. So on, the, on 2014, 11th of November, we have the ethnic contribution being kind of used to get more people into the army and prolong war. Preventing another war is the title today. 
I don't know how much we are able to prevent, we can only try. For Virginia Woolf, photographs of mutilated bodies should be published every day, so as to almost kind of, kind of desensit sorry, so as to make us kind of aware of the cost of warfare at an everyday experiential level. Organizations such as the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, they are incredibly important. But at the same time, also what is needed, I think, is a psychological and sociocultural shift of perception that Selika touched upon. The foundational text in conflict and peace studies remains the German philosopher Immanuel Kant's Perpetual Peace, a philosophical sketch in 1795, written in the context of another war. And for Kant, particularly for his famous dictum that the law of world citizenship shall be limited to the conditions of universal hospitality, that is predicated on something that Kant didn't find in his world order then, nor we have it now, and that is symmetrical relationship between nation. For Kant, this principle of citiz world citizenship based on hospitality is not possible in an asymmetrical world order. And it's exactly this point that the Indian humanist and Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore was voicing during and immediately after the First World Wars as he told America, some 20 cities during the First World War. He went to Japan. He was quite appalled by the military aggression of Japan at that time. Immediately after the First World War, he was lecturing both in Germany and in England. And I'll end with some kind of, kind of a short extract from Tagore because I think it's so pertinent today in our context as we have another kind of fresh kind of burst of kind of xenophobic nationalism. For Tagore, the main, the, the root cause of the First World War was nationalism. And by nationalism, he didn't mean just Western nationalism. Tagore was one of the few people who was anti-imperialist but also anti-nationalist. He had very little time for Indian nationalists. And I'll just quote. This European war of nations is the war of retribution. The time has come when for the sake of the whole outraged world, Europe should fully know in her own person the terrible absurdity of the thing called the nation. The nation has thriven long upon mutilated humanity. Men, the fairest creations of God, came out of the national manufactory in huge numbers as war-making and money-making puppets ludicrously vain of their pitiful perfection of mechanism. Human society grew more and more into a marionette show of politicians, soldiers, manufacturers, and bureaucrats, pulled by war arrangements of wonderful efficiency. And Tagore here is talking in the context of colonialism, nationalism, and industrial modernity. And we can, I think, say very similar things in the context of today's world, in the context of, you know, nationalism, new imperialism, and uh, Brexit-ridden Britain. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry, I've been rather derelict as chair. I should have said that um, this, is, this event is, being, uh, is on the record and it is being live streamed. I should also say that if you want to tweet about it, it's ch events, hashtag, hashtag ch events. Now, very pleased to be hearing from Jonathan Powell next. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to approach the subject from the point of view of a practitioner. When I left government, I set up a small charity to work on armed conflicts around the world uh, on the basis of my experience in Northern Ireland, and we're now working on 11 different conflicts. And I'll take this issue of preventing another world war. Now, of course, prevention is what we always want. I deal mainly with trying to resolve conflicts. And you really don't want to find yourself doing that. If you look at Colombia, where a 60-year war left nearly a quarter of a million dead and millions displaced. In Burma, a 70-year war has left similar numbers displaced and killed. Uh, but it's very easy to talk about preventing, but much harder to do. Um, I'm going to approach it through three different conflicts, which, in my view, could uh, turn into a world war, any, any one of them, and what one can do to try and prevent them. The first I want to posit is North Korea, the Korean Peninsula where we've heard terrifying rhetoric from, from both sides, from President Trump 
uh, from Kim Jong-un uh, throwing uh, verbal bombs at each other. I think uh, my position would be that both sides are perfectly rational. Neither side wants to die. Neither side, therefore, wants to start a war. But a bit like the beginning of the First World War, the danger is uh, that people trip into war by accident, by miscalculation, by misunderstanding. Take, for example, the bloody nose strategy that we read about in the New York Times, supposedly adopted by the US government, where they want to teach the North Koreans a lesson, not to start a war, but simply to hit them. The danger with that is that your bloody nose may not be understood by the other side. They may see it instead as an all-out attack rather than simply a bloody nose, and that will lead to a response of a massive nature that you simply won't be able to cope with. The UN uh, has not been able to uh, get any traction on this subject. It's provided the pressure on North Koreans through sanctions, but provides nothing by way of trying to actually resolve the conflict. There is no military-to-military -military contact between the North Koreans uh, and the Americans, so no way of avoiding a mistake of an airplane flying into another airplane or into its space. Uh, there is no political communication. There is no full understanding of the other side and what they mean. For example, the, uh, the North Koreans find it very difficult indeed to understand Trump's America. What is his intention? When Tillerson says something and is contradicted by uh, Trump or by McMaster, what does that mean? Who should they really be listening to? So you find yourself, in the case of North Korea, a bit again like the First World War, without a framework, with misunderstandings, with every ability to tip into a conflict very quickly and unintentionally. I'll come back to the possible solutions at the end, just for purposes of time. So that's North Korea, a crisis that would drag everyone in, it would drag China in if it were to kick off, uh, and you'd find yourself in a real conflict. And the danger, as I say, is the First World War, that misunderstanding, miscalculation that would lead you into it. The second is Syria, uh, which at the moment looks increasingly like Bosnia in 1914. Uh, you have the Russians obviously involved on the ground, you have Iran fully involved on the ground, uh, you have Hezbollah, you have the Saudis in the Gulf, you have the US, uh, and now you have Turkey as well on the ground. So you have a whole series of both regional and great powers involved in Syria uh, and actually beginning to hit each other because the most worrying incident is the one over the weekend, last weekend, uh, or before last weekend, when the uh, Iranians flew a drone into Israel, Israel hit back, a plane was hit, they then hit the air defense system of the Syrians. They ended up killing uh, an unknown number of Russians. The Americans, very shortly before that, had also killed an unknown number of Russians in responding to attack. That is the sort of uh, political uh, maelstrom, the military maelstrom, that could lead you into a conflict entirely unintentionally. You have countries in there uh, with um, interests that they are pursuing. You have no real uh, military way of uh, avoiding them tripping into each other. Uh, and you have the UN unable to act. Ever since we said that uh, we had a red line and then failed to enforce that red line, we had no real way of using the UN to actually pull things back. So we have plenty of uh, resolutions. So again, a bit like the League of Nations at the time of Abyssinia. We have plenty of resolutions, but no will to enforce those resolutions. If you're not going to enforce those resolutions, they become meaningless. The body itself becomes meaningless. What is the point if you're going to be vetoed in anything you do in resorting to the UN to try and get uh, to a conclusion? Uh, the UN negotiations in Geneva are clearly going nowhere and Assad is prepared to negotiate. And so far, he's even refused to turn up. Again, it's a bit like Mussolini's attitude towards Abyssinia. He wasn't prepared to take seriously any of the resolutions of the League of Nations or any of the pressure and the great powers weren't prepared to really push him hard. As the French ambassador said yesterday in the UN Security Council, uh, if the UN is not prepared to stand up on issues like this, what point is there of the UN when you see what's happening to the people in eastern Ghouta? Third conflict, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'll be very brief on this, although it's a huge potential one, and people have written many uh, very good books on the subject, of course, is US-China. And this is the Thucydides trap of the idea of a rising power running into an established power in the way that uh, Germany ran into the United Kingdom in the First World War and in many other cases as uh, the Graham Allison book uh, catalogues. Again, here we have uh, uh, very clearly a rising power running into a, um, uh, an existing power. We have a president whose rhetoric is not always entirely unguarded uh, on the subject and who uh, is pushing a whole series of different interests, including uh, trade interests, in a way that may well be misunderstood on the Chinese side of the debate. We do, in this case, have military-to-military -military channels, and thank goodness we do, so that you can avoid a pure accident of a plane running into another or a 
25-year-old pilot pulling a trigger by mistake. There are ways of avoiding that. But what it seems to me is lacking is any political framework uh, to avoid the mistakes of a great power being challenged by a rising power and falling again into a First World War uh, type of conflict. The UN has precisely no role in that at all, uh, and we're left at the mercy of uh, Mari Lago dinners and chocolate cake uh, as the only way of resolving it. So if I'm right in presenting these three, what seem to me extremely dangerous situations uh, that could all tip into another world war, what do we have left to try and deal with it? And I think the danger is of the UN turning into another League of Nations, as the French ambassador said. It seems to be frozen and unable to adapt. If you think of the debate on R2P, the right to protect, uh, what, 10 years ago, no, a bit more, 15 years ago now, it failed to actually change the UN. They were, could not be adopted. The UN could not take the decisions to act where it had to, for example, in Kosovo. And because it was unable to act in Kosovo, we found a coalition of the United States, United Kingdom, and others acting because they knew they faced a Russian uh, a veto. We had an even worse situation, of course, with Iraq, uh, where people pushed ahead, even though they would have been voted down, uh, including me, I should say, in, in, the, in the United Nations. So unless the, it seems to me imperative that the United Nations find some way of uh, adapting, finding some way that it can act, that it can stop escalation of the sort that we're seeing in Syria, and that the vetoes don't simply become a block to any action, because if they do, we will then face unilateral action of the sort that we could face, for example, between China and the United States. I think there is a second way of looking for a salvation, and that is through regional organizations. I worked for a long time in the 80s on the CSCE, which pulled together all of the European countries and Russia and the United States and provided a very good framework um, for uh, avoiding conflict between those countries of the Warsaw Pact and of NATO. That lacks in places like uh, Northeast Asia. If you had a CSE in Northeast Asia, you would have some sort of framework that could pull the issues of security, of nuclear weapons, of economics, uh, and of politics together. There would be some sort of framework into which the Korean Peninsula conflict fitted. So it seems to me you can also look for answers there. But thirdly and lastly, the, the key, it seems to me, is about communication and about dialogue. The failure to have that communication with North Korea, the failure to have that communication inside Syria, and the failure to have the sort of communication we need between China and the, uh, uh, and the United States. And that doesn't necessarily depend on institutions. It can depend on individuals and NGOs. They can play that role of generating back channels, discussions, communication that can really make a difference. So I don't want to end sort of feeling uh, too depressed about all of this. It is not inevitable that any one of these turns into another world war. We don't have to make the mistakes again, that we made in the First World War, but we are lacking the institutions, we are lacking the framework, and most of all, we're lacking the dialogue to try and avoid it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, uh, Peter, apps. Right, well, I, sh I shall be quick <clears throat> and swift, as I'm aware that I'm the only thing between you guys, a panel discussion and then drinks. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to take a fairly personal view at this. Um, uh, my name's Peter Apps, I'm, I'm 33, so I, I came of age in, in 1999, just as the Kosovo War was starting. Um, I'm also an army reservist, so I'm going to give a subaltern's eye view on, on the panel. Uh, and I'm an army reservist because, having been in the reserves at university, I was recalled voluntarily, because they gave me a choice, uh, two and a, just over two years ago uh, to advise the British Army on hybrid warfare, information warfare, and this kind of stuff, because Russia had invaded Crimea. And I was very struck when I came back to my parents' house in Essex after my first three days back in uniform in 15 odd years. I never expected to wear a uniform again. I broke my neck covering the Sri Lanka war, and that was a good decade in the past. And I was sitting there with my couple of nieces, and, and my grandmother had died about a year before. We were going through the, the family photo albums, and you realize that world wars punctuate family history in this country, but also in a very large, huge swathes of the planet, uh, probably less Latin America, interestingly enough. Uh, they don't last very long. Less than nine years of the 20th century was taken up with wars. That was half the length of the Afghan war that began on Jonathan's watch. Um, but they produced massive, <laughs> sorry, I hadn't meant to put it in quite those terms. Um, but they, they produced massive societal change on an unimaginable level. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book about Winston Churchill's time in the trenches. And one of the things I was struck by, the soldiers he was serving with, many of them had never seen a car until the beginning, or barely would have seen a car until the outbreak of the First World War, and suddenly they're in a world where they are surrounded by tanks, where they're surrounded by light aircraft, where they're surrounded by belt-fed machine guns, where every piece of technology they had ever dreamed of, and a very large number they hadn't, 
were ripping their world apart. Um, and it happened very, very suddenly. Um, and the world was never the same again. Um, I was sitting at Rusi a few weeks ago at a conference on urban warfare, and I was struck by the fact that actually the uniform, the, the, the what do they call it, future army dress, the British army, because ironically it's unchanged since 1919. Um, that, that is the same period of time that elapsed between the Battle of Waterloo and the First World War. Uh, the societal change between the Battle of Waterloo and the First World War was in many ways much, much, much greater than that we have seen over the last hundred years. But I think the thing that is really worth remembering is we may be about to enter another period of that technological shift. When I'm training the soldiers that I work with the British Army these days, I sort of feel a bit like I'm an army officer from about 1910. I can't quite see the new technology coming over the horizon. Some people can. British Army's got some incredibly good people who do thinking that I can't get my head around on things like artificial intelligence. Um, but you know, as battery life gets gets better, as um, as, uh, as drones get smaller, different, they walk, they can dig their way into the ground, they can float in the sea, all kinds of tools get better. And as several panelists said before, the way in which we fight is changing. I suspect that if we do have a third world war, the historians who write the history afterwards will probably claim it started around 1999. You know, the invasion of Kosovo, which very quickly and very nearly led to direct conflict between NATO troops and Russian troops at Pristina Airport, was, as far as the way the Russians see it, the beginning of a longer confrontation. Uh, you know, they, that was followed by the Georgia War, where they felt that they pushed back at us a bit. They proved that if we could take bits of countries off people and rebrand them in the spirit of, of right to protect, so could they. They did that in Georgia. They've obviously done that again in Ukraine. Um, that has fundamentally changed the way in which we approach warfare in Europe. It's put warfare in Europe back on the agenda. I was in Narva earlier this year, a uh, Russian-speaking city on the front between the Baltic states and Russia. And I don't think anyone in that town had even dreamed until two and a half years ago that they might be a place where a, firstly, where a third world war might start, but even more worryingly for them, where it might not where a limited war in the Baltic states might go on as it's going on Ukraine forever, that we might not have the guts to blow up the world by having a war between Russia and the United and, 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 and NATO, but we might just have a small war in their hometown. And of course, that is exactly what has happened in Syria, uh, by far the bloodiest war of the, 20, of the 21st century so far, and one of the bloodiest if you go back into the latter bits of the 20th. You know, the Syrian dynamics of that war would probably have allowed it to burn out quite a long time ago. Instead, various different players have pushed things, and, you get, and then when you bring in cyberspace, you get a whole bunch of, of different kind of spaces. Um, now, does that mean we're heading towards a, a new world war? Almost certainly not, certainly not, definitely. The reason that we haven't had a world war in the last 75 years is incredibly simple. We may not know what the route to a third world war looks like, but we know what the last day looks like. And that means that it becomes quite easy not to start. The reason why NATO and Russian troops didn't pile into each other at Pristina Airport in the way they unquestionably would have done in 1925 was that it was very, very clear to people sitting on both sides where things would go. And it was very clear to their civil populations. The downside is that, as Jonathan said, Jonathan sketched out three uh, routes. Europe is clearly not that much safer. There are a whole bunch of other ways in which the world could fall apart if you want to go into a bit more blue sky thinking. My instinct is that the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years will see at least two or three Cuban Missile Crisis type scares. And we may well see a limited exchange somewhere that kills a lot of people. We were sitting earlier this afternoon in a discussion of you know, what would it take to have a new 14 points from Woodrow Wilson. I suspect we will have them in the next century. I suspect my niece, who's now four, will see something like that happen in her life, and I suspect she will see it happen after something horrific has happened. Now, whether that is something horrific that is a limited confrontation where everyone realizes that we nearly had a nuclear war and we backed down, uh, if you look at some of the Russian doctrines around preemptive nuclear strikes, if they were to fight a war with us in Eastern Europe, their doctrine is very simple. They would then threaten to either attack a single city or ship or formation with a nuclear warhead, or they would do so and then they would dare us to back down. The Chinese have different approaches to this, but you know, everyone, has their, everyone has their models. We may go over the edge into that. We may go quite a long way over the edge. We could easily go so far uh, that we basically lose half the planet. The reason wars start, though, and I think this applies to every war I've ever covered, whether I've been on the ground or else, is that at least one side thinks they can win. You know, I would argue that is probably 
true of the Afghan war, it's probably true of the Iraq war, that the UK was involved in launching over the last 20 years, but it's also true of the Sri Lankan war uh, that I was involved in. Both sides thought they could win. It is very difficult to delude yourself of that in the 21st century. However, military power works. The Russian economy is the size of the economy of New York State. The North Korean economy is the size of Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> Those two countries are both major global powers, and I don't think anyone would deny them that status, but they hold that status because they have a lot of people in uniform, they have a lot of big rockets. Other countries may well take that lesson over the next 100 years. It would be amazing if they did not. And that means we will have some fairly alarming afternoons to come. I'm going to hand back to Polly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, there's plenty to be afraid of, plenty to think about. I'm going to start, though, by calling um, Patricia Lewis, who is going to, because there's been an all-day discussion, and perhaps some of you have been here all day, looking at Woodrow Wilson's 40 points, and she has collated seven that have been seven new ones that have been added. So well, let's thank, hear them. Thanks, Polly, and thanks to all the great speakers. So we've been all day, the group of young people and older people, people from all over the world, um, looking at Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. We were doing this um, with the Meridian International Center in Washington, D.C. It's a partnership that we have with them, looking at the lessons we can learn from World War I, funded by the Richard Lansbury Foundation. So thanks to everyone um, in that regard. Um, and we've come up uh, in this group with uh, seven uh, points. So two points for, um, Woodrow Wilson came up with 14, we came up with half that, that number. So, um, so number one, we shall prioritize diplomacy. As one of the most important ways to prevent conflict, we shall ring fence public diplomacy spending in the way that we do for defense and international aid. We shall, number two, we shall establish global norms for tax structures so that every member of every country is subject to fair taxation and inequalities are reduced. Number three, we shall redouble global efforts to address climate change and ensure that the Paris Agreement is implemented as fully as possible. Number four, we shall reorder and reframe the international system to be more representative. Representation for sub-state groups and minority peoples will be included at all levels at the UN and its associated institutions. Number five, we shall recharge the United Nations uh, Security Council to ensure that new mechanisms can be established for agreement and ensure that interventions can only take place with full agreement throughout the whole of the UN system. We should set up, number six, we shall set up in place further measures to prevent conflict and curb military aggression, including increased emphasis on disarmament and arms reduction and controls, including controls on cyber weaponry. And number seven, finally, we shall increase the international emphasis and commitment to sustainable development and education for all. And we shall support good governance practices and funding for education, particularly for girls. So there's our seven Woodrow Wilson points for the 21st century, devised by a whole group of people working hard at them today. So thank you very much for that opportunity, Polly. To thank you very much. That's very interesting and encouraging. I suspect there must be a lot of um, would-be diplomats here, because I can't think of anywhere else where I've been where somebody has suggested the top priority should be ring-fencing the budget of the Foreign Office. <laughs> but high time, that, high time that we did, and a very good idea too. Now, it's your turn. And so let's hear from you. Uh, questions from the floor and points. Um, put your hand up if you're... Um, I'll put my glasses on, see who's around. Um, yes, I'll start with you there, then I'll come to you in the front. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, so I'm Emily Hall, Ministry of Defence. Um, you were talking about um, how the importance of sort of cohesion and... Um, the um, US posture at the moment talks a lot about um, strength, and um, this sort of seems to be at odds with what you were talking about. Um, is that just my perspective, or do you think we can sort of marry the two so that we can at the same time be very strong and uh, defensive, if you like, but also um, not xenophobic and very inc inclusive was the word you used? There are different groups within our political structure and within our population. And right now, because of gerrymander and because extremists um, are more likely to be elected, 
um, the group that is in power is disproportionately isolationist and disproportionately America first. Um, we have a group that has always been, um, it has always been represented in both parties, in the Democratic and the Republican Party, white supremacists. But now they have been emboldened by this election to be much louder and much more demanding. Uh, xenophobia and America First go together hand in glove. If you read Hamby's classic liberalism and its challengers, it's, that impulse has always been there in the US. Um, so their vision of strength is in part based on that xenophobia. But it seems like strength is also the word that NATO uses. Um, talking about strength and cohesion between nations. Um, so it's, it's slightly different from just xenophobia, but this idea of kind of everybody rallying together. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you can, it just doesn't sort of. You can be strong, but xenophobia is a weakness that allows subversion. Um, you cannot be strong if xenophobia drives your policy. That is the problem. So you can have a whole lot of technological weapons. Uh, and the US has always assumed that we would continue to maintain a monopoly in many ways on global power. And that assumption is slipping in China. And that assumption is beginning to slip in Russia. If strength is technology, you can be strong and xenophobic. But if strength is the ability to project power into places like the Ukraine and Georgia, then you need allies. So I, the US has choices to make in the midterm elections will tell us what those choices will be. There has always been an internationalist group, and there have always been immigrants in the US. The US, despite what it may seem, has always been an immigrant-friendly country. Um, we're going to have to decide what that word strength means. Can I be really cheeky and extend my question to Peter and ask no, well, you? No, I don't, what? you can actually. No, We've got okay. quite a few Sorry, people. Fair enough, fair <laughs> a bit I would like to say that you started off with your talk by saying, you know, nationalism is there everywhere and ready to leap out again at any time. So it's not just America. That happens to be a particular mood in America at the moment. But it's uh, endemic in every nation and it's held down with any luck. But it's ready to leap out. We are seeing it resurging across the globe. Nationalism and populism, um, and this, and this is xenophobia. Every yeah. country is having to deal with this fear of the refugee and this fear of the immigrant. And it's in part because technology is challenging our ideas of what citizenship means. It's challenging our culture. It's challenging our idea of what being male and female is. And when in history, when we've seen those sort of challenges, at the turn of the century, we saw those challenges, people turn inward. Uh, the good news is history is a cha-cha. It's two steps forward, one back. Two steps forward, one back. Sometimes it feels the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you're right. We have, to, we have to travel in hope. Yes, in the front here, we've got somebody. Who else is there who wants to come to us so I can see who's um, around for the microphone next time? We'll take that young man there next time. Uh, John Wilson, uh, <clears throat> a member of this institute, a journalist and a guide at Bletchley Park, the home of the code breakers. My question is this. Mankind is fundamentally selfish, greedy, slothful and hypocritical. Nation states are but extensions of their populations. I believe that a third world war is inevitable and therefore only the dead have seen the end of war. Does the panel agree? <laughs> 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 
there's a misanthro let, let me I have to go something else. There is a mis misanthropic question, if ever there was. Peter, uh, are we that bad? Uh, I mean, uh, it's, 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 one of the junior officers that I trained with told me a great quote, which is that intelligence is a, ma a measure of intelligence is holding two conflicting ideas or opposite ideas simultaneously. Yes, human beings are all of that. However. I know quite a few, and lots of them are lovely in a very wide variety <laughs> of ways. Um, and actually, the same is true of nation states. You know, you know, I am alive today to you know, drink my gin and tonic because I live in a nation state that went to quite a lot of effort over quite a long time, over quite a lot of governments of every political persuasion, to build structures that meant that if someone like me wakes up over the front end of a vehicle, and they can't feel anything below their shoulders, that they can still have a fighting chance of being a productive member of society. You know, I think, you know, most countries like to believe that they stand for doing the right thing on a bad day, even if that opens the door to all kinds of massive, you know, as countries like to think, this is definitely true of the UK, but it's also true everywhere else I've been, that they are at the very least in the better third of countries worldwide. Uh, and you can play off that quite a lot, I think. I mean, you, you may be right, the future is a bloody long time, and we may have a third world war in it, but um, I think there'll be a lot of effort put in by a lot of people to avoid it. Jonathan, I'll be that bad. Um, uh, that's such a brilliant answer, I can't, I can't top that. I think I, the point is that, of course, there is the danger of a third world war, as I described. The question is, can we put our efforts into stopping it happening, and can we develop the institutions, the frameworks, most of all, the dialogue that does that? And we can. Uh, it's not inevitable to be a third world war any more than it's inevitable that anything else will happen. We should put our efforts into doing that. That's very obscene, but I think conflict <laughs> is one of the situations where you also get to see the nicer qualities, like vulnerability, helping each other, like if you read the French accounts of people. So I think war is one of the strange things that you get to see the good qualities. And yes, if nation state, you know, the one you say that selfish, nasty, I think I take at the moment kind of consolation from New Zealand under Jacinda, when you see some of the nicer qualities maybe. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to ask if you're a historian. <laughs> But I was going to a historian, because historians tend to believe human beings are irrational and motivated by selfish urges. But what, it's what separates us from economists, who think human beings are rational. <laughs> and if you've lived with any other human being, you know that's just, that's tough. Um, I'm going to pull out the Tesla slash Oppenheimer quote which is that the Third World War will be fought with nukes, and the Fourth World War will be fought with rocks. <laughs> and I'm going to hope that this essential selfishness of humans will be what will prevent us from having that Third World War. Although I did tell my children one time that the reason why I believe in God is that we have not blown up the planet given how crazy humans are on a regular basis. So you're with Peter, really, that, that, that it's the nuclear bomb that I was brought up in terror of that actually has saved this. Uh, and rational actors. You know, the, the problem with my own thesis would be if a non-state actor who is a dominionist and a religious extremist got a nuclear warhead, or if a religious extremist infiltrated one of the P5 countries. And the vice president of my country is a religious extremist who believes that Armageddon would bring the Messiah back. Pray. <laughs> there was a young man over there. Next, we've got the microphone. Yep, and then I'll come, I'll come to you next, gentleman, in the second row. Um, Joe Mansell uh, from the Ministry of Defence. Um, I was just wondering what role you think Sub-Saharan Africa would play um, in any developing world war or the development of any world war? Fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to think they, they would be one of several voices of sanity. Uh, I mean, I used to be based in Southern Africa and if you were knocking around, Southern, if you were a bit older than me, you were knocking around Southern Africa in the early 90s, everyone in South Africa believed that the South African apartheid system would collapse in a truly genocidal, cataclysmic conflict. And there are many things wrong with South Africa, there are many things wrong with Southern Africa, but one of the things that has been massively impressive 
uh, about to me over the last 15 years is that virtually none of, none of those problems ever look close to being solved, being solved with military conflict. The same is increasingly true of Latin America. Um, you know, uh, now, you, if you go far enough north, you start running into the same wars we have in the Middle East, the Boko Haram stuff, the East Africa you know, and stuff. But you are, you know, that, that, is, that is not, you know, I would view that as being a part of the Middle Eastern mess rather than being a part of the African mess. I would like to think that one of the places one might find a bit of last minute leadership saying, do not do this because the rest of us will suffer, might well be the South in general and, and possibly some Saharan Africa in particular. With that. Yes, I mean, there are plenty of wars in Africa of their own, um, and including in southern Africa, really, if you can Mozambique, where the Renamo Frelimo conflict started again. Um, but I do think one of the things we don't have from uh, the First World War, the Second World War, is global alliances that will all pile in. That is one advantage that we have. So there isn't an alliance that couples together Africa, etc. So if you had a world war that started in North Korea, it might involve China and the United States, and that would drag in the NATO allies and would drag in others in Asia, but might not drag in Africa, and we might not drag in Latin America. So I suppose from that point of view, there is some salvation that there'll be bits of the world that still be livable in in those circumstances. But they have plenty of wars of their own, so it's not that they're umbilicos, they're just not part of alliances. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll get you to answer the next question. Um, gentleman here in the white jacket. Who have um, we got? Sorry, who have we got? Somebody yeah, there. Who yeah. else? Are there any other women anywhere here? Yes, we'll come to you next. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, Ewan Grant, um, former law enforcement intelligence analyst covering the ex Soviet Union and a former pupil of a school where the head teacher's professor at the LSE was one of the Sarajevo assassins in 1914. Um, like Peter, I've worked, but on a separate occasion, at Narva in Estonia, where the head of the border guards there looked at me and said, you know what happened here in 1944? And the clear implication in his, um, the look on his face was too many people who come from Brussels either have forgotten or never knew in the first place. My question is, um, to the rest of the panel, what do you have to respond to Peter's comment that for better or for worse, military power works and that North Korea with such a tiny economy is such a major player. And for Peter himself, how do you find the economists, the people who are not strategists like yourself and, uh, and are perhaps rational economists, how do they react to what I regard as a very uncomfortable but very realistic message you're sending. Thank you. Thank you. Um, power works. Military power Military is important. Power. power works. I'm not going to say that I believe that we could get every country to disarm. Um, I come from a people, I was born in Louisiana, and the reason why segregation and terror were imposed on the, my people in that area is because we were stripped of guns. Power works. Terror works. So you have to keep a certain amount of weaponry to protect yourself and so to deter irrationality. It wouldn't have been segregation if you had guns. I'm not suggesting that several historians are. If you look at the white leagues who nearly staged a coup in Louisiana in 1878, if you look at the Battle of Tangipahoa Parish, and if you, the book that I am writing right now is an armed, about an armed militia in Louisiana in 1965 that fought the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan to force the enforcement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. <coughs> to a certain extent, there are, there are a set of people in this world that the only thing they will understand is power. The only thing they will understand is force. And we hope that as we move forward, that group becomes smaller and smaller. But to imagine that they are not there is naive. So you have to have force in order to have peace. How do you feel about that, Santana? <laughs> uh, 
Interestingly, it's immediately after the First World War that people were thinking quite actively about powerlessness, like starting with, I mean, the intellectuals. So it's a very, very small group, but I was thinking of Virginia Woolf when she writes A Room of One's Moon, that I just kind of thought of the, I, as a woman, I want no country, I have no country, the whole world is my home because I don't have power. Tagore in India is saying exactly the same thing, but there are very small coteries, so yes, power works. But I think part of our effort to prevent another war is to begin the journey towards powerlessness or to be happy with a state of powerlessness. But then that's quite utopian. I completely agree with that. Well, well, just to say that I don't think it's about military power necessarily. There are many countries that have very large armies who are no particular threat. It's, I think the point Peter was making is about nuclear weapons. And it's not necessarily having nuclear weapons, it's what you threaten to do with them. So the reason North Korea gets attention is really more to do with terrorism rather than to do with its large army. It's that it, is, it appears to be threatening uh, the outside world, and that's why people give it attention. Peter. Uh, I mean, I think a uh, couple of rights. Military power works, but mainly as long as you don't use it. You know, as soon as you actually try and use it, you tend to often demonstrate the limitations of it. Uh, I mean, the, the best example of this would be um, I mean, you know, both Napoleon and Hitler built phenomenal military machines and then delivered a masterclass in overstretch. Um, you know, the truth is that military power works, but everyone who has tried to firstly take over a country and then use that country to take over the world by military force has faced a hard stop from everyone else who would just rather they didn't. And <laughs> that is a, you know, that is an abrupt warning to anyone who, who, is, who feels tempted to do that. On the economist side, I think one of the things economists are often very good at is spotting the bigger picture. Um, Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs came up with his brick thesis on 9-11 itself because he was thinking about how Al-Qaeda had taken advantage of the various systems of globalization, particularly airlines, he thought who will the real beneficiaries be of globalization. His conclusion was that it would be the BRICS. So I think economists are often very good at looking past that, where all the governments, particularly in, in, in the US, UK, were getting very, you know, very much looking at the problem in front of them, looking at everything from a very counter-terrorism perspective. He took a step back and I think delivered one of the most sort of compelling early arguments for how the century was going to progress very quickly from that pointer. So I think economists have a lot going for them. Well, it looked so then, when he said it, it looks quite a lot less so now in terms of economic powerhouses. Uh, I mean, up to Brazil, a point, but Russia, if you, you come, come, China, yes, South Africa, not so much. Come, come back to the world in 2100, mm. and you will see a planet where the amount of economic power that has leached from the white Anglo Saxon centres to other places will be substantial, even if it hasn't happened quite as quickly as, as, as he thought. Left. There was, uh, who was it? Over here, Sec uh, third row. <clears throat> Hi, um, Anna Willis, Chatham House member and journalist for The Young European. Um, and this is actually a question for all five of you, including Polly. So you're all writers, readers and communicators. And so how much power do you believe that you have with the written word, particularly in um, relation to what we've been discussing with preventing world wars? way away from ruling the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think as a journalist, one doesn't think in terms of what power you have. Though you do look at things like the Daily Mail and think, yes, there are other people who do have huge cultural influence and you hope you have a little yourself. Um, but I think you mislead yourself very quickly as a journalist if you delude yourself in thinking you are writing because you are influencing the world as opposed to <clears throat> describing the world as you think it is or you think you, you see you report. I think <clears throat> that academe is probably the worst place to be <laughs> if you want power and influence. <laughs> um, I, as a historian, I have the power to shape worldviews. But the thing that I'm always conscious of is that half of the students that come into my class will be liberal, half will be conservative. And then as they go out, half will be liberal and half will be conservative. People will take what they need and their confirmation biases will lead them to what they believe. If I can nudge them a little bit. Do you yeah. think you do too? 
I think do I we do too. Do we pick our favorite facts? I think we do too, but I think being an academe means that I am more conscious of it and feel more guilty about it. <laughs> and I have colleagues who will be louder and more obnoxious and obstreperous about telling me when I'm cherry picking for rice. <laughs> How influential do you feel? No, I, lo I largely agree with you know, Salika as kind of my subject is English literature. So I hope that kind of half would be liberal, half would be conservative, and they leave if slightly more than half would be liberal. Just before the discussion, you mentioned that Cassandra, like, like academics are like Cassandras, like we see it coming and yet we can't do anything. And I think that's a wonderful image. Now you've been very powerful in your time. <laughs> Um, but maybe you still are, because... No, there's a power to persuade and there's a power to explain, and that belongs to those politicians who are really able to lead. If you're in power, if you go into Number 10 Downing Street, you actually have very few levers on power. You have very few civil servants, you have very little by way of budget. The only way you can lead is by um, inspiring other people, and you have to do that with words, whether they're your cabinet colleagues or the country as a whole. So whether you're a politician or, frankly, a soldier trying to lead men either, it's all about the power to persuade and the power to explain just diff done in different ways. Reuters is powerful. Well, I have a backdoor key to the Reuters website, so I know exactly how many people read each one of my columns, and believe me, it has not improved my self-esteem. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, I th which I think itself is quite an important point, which is that it used to be that if you got a job as global affairs columnist, Reuters, you know, commentator, Guardian, that bought that, that was the price of a ticket to be over an MP or to reaching a large number of people. I think though that is gradually breaking down. It's not breaking down completely by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I think the sort of democratized nature of social media uh, means that it is much harder to say that you know, there are very few must read columnists on the planet now, with great respect to Polly or Lisa, who have viewed that way. Uh, compared to say 20 years ago, you know, there's a lot more people, and it's a lot more different outlets. If I look at what's getting read and linked to, you know, they may be smaller websites, and they may not be true. You know, it, you've got a, a much broader form of democratization. I think where things make a difference is, I mean, a, and this probably goes for being a politician or a soldier or a journalist. There are times when being in the right, in a particular place, a particular time, means that you can achieve effect. The only times I've ever achieved anything as a journalist are when I have been in a place that means that I have been able to say that something happened and nobody else has been able to stop me because I was there. To give a good example, killing of 17 aid workers in Eastern Sri Lanka in 2006. A month before I broke my neck, so I haven't done that much reporting like that. But I was there, I was able to demonstrate not quite who killed them, but that at the time they were killed, because I was in the autopsy, that a certain, well, the Sri Lankan military, held that area of the town. That, had a very limited but real effect because that allowed people like you know much higher up various chains to say okay we can work from that and if a journalist had not gone to the trouble of going there it's one of the reasons why journalists get killed so quickly it's one of the reasons why people kill journalists because they want to shut them up journalists who say this is how the world should be probably achieve very little most of the time journalists who say this is what happened and also can give a voice to people who would not otherwise have a voice particularly people in this sharp end of conflict can on occasion, change things very limitedly. It didn't make a huge difference. 30,000 people died on the beach two, three years later. Uh, but that's where you can at least change history, because history is, history is just people doing stuff. And people who are powerful one day are not powerful the next. So there are windows where you can achieve stuff. Now, can I have some advice as to how long we can go on for? Because we started late. <clears throat> what? Um, oh, another 10. OK. Oh, five, <clears throat> because we all want to drink. Uh, right, um, who have we got here? S uh, somebody at the back and then somebody here at the front. <clears throat> uh, hi, um, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Chris, a political economy student from King's College London, so <coughs> fellow person from the chair there. Um, but my question is basically, um, so we have this world which has the 14 points and it's got sort of like um, a collection of nation states, which obviously, so I haven't really asked questions of this before, so I'm quite nervous, but um, my yeah. basic question is that we have nation states, we obviously have institutions which are designed to bring about peace, like um, the League of Nations, United, um, United Nations, NATO, CETO, but obviously world wars still continue and everything, and conflicts still continue. Um, and one of the um, points of conflict which we talked about was um, America versus China, 
which is obviously a rising power, but it's also one which has emerged after we've had the sort of the hegemonic world, which is obviously Western oriented around America after the collapse of communism. Um, so obviously you went from a bipolar world to a hegemonic world. But I think that what we really should be asking is how we can have a multipolar world. Um, so rather than establishing institutions which are supposed to encompass all countries, because I believe that as nation states, that's why we always have the issue of vetoes um, limiting their effectiveness. Um, rather, we should have a multipolar sort of set up of nation states where they're obviously allowed to act independently of one another without sort of imposing the rules and so forth. Um, but I think what the West often tries to do and leads to conflict. Um, so I think that instead of lo looking to um, Woodrow Wilson in the 14 points, perhaps we should um, consider a person like Gorbachev who envisioned a multipolar world um, where you don't really have the domination of one style of governance over the rest of the world. Um, I was just wondering what you guys thought about that. How do you feel about that? Uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, peace and history of the world and be specific, yes. We are in a multipolar world. We live in this, this post-Cold War multipolar world. And that's what makes the 14 points both interesting and frightening because applying the, multi applying the 14 points to a world where multiple countries have nuclear warheads is quite a scary exercise. Uh, your question really is asking how can we have a world without superpowers? And that is a harder question. Human nature has, and human history, um, has moved towards superpowers, starting with the Greek, the Greek nation states. Um, as one of the things that the UN does is it reigns in the superpowers. Rather than have a colonial world like we had in the 19th century, um, our default has moved to the idea that countries should have self-determination. Countries should have some sort of control. What you articulated would not have been articulated in this place in 1856. So I would say individual education and these contexts, these cross-cultural, cross-country contexts may not replace superpowers. We may always have superpowers, but will lead us to that more peaceful world. That's optimistic. Um, I'm going to ask just one person, to, should we get more questions in one person to answer each one? Uh, John Warren, <coughs> a physician and member. Uh, at Versailles, a lot of the elected leaders had considerable intellectual prowess, and yet you still had the treaty as it was. What would some future Versailles look like if a lot of the leaders were elected on the basis of them being populist and widespread exposure to low quality TV programs, say like The Apprentice? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jonathan, that's for you. Would, would, a, would a, a Versailles type treaty drawn up now be significantly worse? Or as you're suggesting, that you had these big brains and they came up with something not so good? Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, it would certainly be a lot shorter if Trump was negotiating it. You'd get it in um, how many words is you get into a tweet. So, it would, <laughs> luckily, actually, it's not leaders who normally negotiate treaties. It's uh, people lower down the, the, the food chain who do it. So, you might still have intellectual input. I don't think the problem with Versailles was the intellectual firepower of the leaders. It was more the, uh, their inability to see beyond their, the self-interest of their nations and see the rather longer-term mutual self-interest that might have led to a treaty that might have been more effective uh, at preventing another war quite so rapidly. Because although we've been talking about another world war coming, it is remarkable how long we've managed to avoid one this time. Uh, and that is part because uh, the people who, who remember the last war are no longer really uh, are with us. <coughs> So we have managed to get beyond the memory that stopped, prevented um, the Second World War for, happening for a long period of time. Now we have to actually have 
uh, the understanding of why the institutions that were created after the war were important, which is why I think the EU, for example, is so important and why our continuing membership is important long after people have forgotten about the Second World War. So the negotiation will be done by different people, not by the leaders. So the fact that Trump is president makes no difference to the, the treaty. What we do need, though, is leaders who have some sense that uh, self-interest of a nation is more than just the very short-term interest of that nation and has some rather longer-term components. Thank you. <clears throat> Who else have we got? Woman right at the back there, um, and a man there, and that had better be enough, I think. <clears throat> Can you hold it right up? Hello? Oh. Yep. <laughs> um, I just wondered, um, Jonathan, your, your talk and the, the, t the comments from leaders recently are focused on major powers, but I wonder how much that is important when non-state actors drained the US and Iraq and Afghanistan and also the reason that the US is now deployed in like 147 countries across the world. Do, should, should, we, should we be looking to to large states to work out how to prevent world wars, or should we be looking to non-state actors? Um, well, I was answering the question about the uh, repeat of a world war, and I don't think that it is likely that non-state actors, that armed groups, will lead to another world war. They will probably lead, if we have managed to avoid a world war, they'll certainly lead to many more dead people, and therefore we should be concentrating increasingly on internal wars, because it is more, more people are dying in internal wars than they are wars between states. And one of the interesting things that's happened is the UN has been unable to deal with the role of mediating in those sort of conflicts. The UN is not allowed into any conflict inside a state. It only really operates in failed states, places like Libya, South Sudan, or uh, Somalia. So there needs to be a better cadre of NGOs, individuals, non-state actors who can go into those conflicts between armed groups and governments where so many people are dying and do something about ending them. But that means they have to have the resources, they have to have the people with the skills to do it, and that's the thing that's lacking. Last question over there, and then I'm going to ask each of you to do one minute each, either in response to that or just your final thought. <clears throat> One quick question about institutions and the role that, and I invite any one of you to answer this, um, the role that NATO should be playing going forward. I mean, it was a, it was a construct f as part of the Cold War. Does it still have a relevance to play within the context of the, um, the, the, the great power conflicts that may be coming up? Or is it actually as likely to be a source of instability um, in the coming years, rather than a source of stability that it provided during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So you feel it has done good in the past? You're not an anti-NATO person? No, no, I think NATO did a right. brilliant job during the Cold War. Does it still have the same sort of right. role to play today? Very good question to end up with. So each of you, I'm going to ask you each. Okay. I would say that NATO still has a role to play. Um, I think that we are closer to the proxy wars, um, and, and asymmetrical war will be proxy wars, and, and NATO has been involved in a number of those. The question for me is what will the United States role in the future be in NATO? Will Germany lead NATO? Will the UK, will the EU? Um, right now, the major general who is in charge always comes from the U.S. Will that continue? Um, so the, the question is, where will NATO go? I believe that NATO will always be here. As long as there's a full gap, I believe there will be a NATO and a need for a NATO. What? Exactly. Do you feel it's positive? I think it's kind of how NATO will kind of, whether it can <clears throat> evolve and how it will evolve. Uh, that will kind of determine its kind of existence or its utility in the changing world rather than what it is at the moment? Um, I think that uh, NATO depends on the promise of United States defense uh, within Europe. And the problem for NATO at the moment is that has been undermined by President Trump coming in and saying that he wouldn't necessarily defend the Baltic states that you were just talking about. So unless that conviction that the United States is going to come to the defense of Europe is reapplied in a convincing way, then NATO certainly won't work. 
But as I said earlier about conflicts, it, none of these things are inevitable, but nor are they necessarily going to happen. They would depend on political will. That depends on people. Uh, so it depends on whether uh, the United States as a whole is prepared to make that commitment to Europe in the future or not. Peter, you get the last word. OK, I mean, I would say, <coughs> I tried to get this at uh, Abigail's question. I, mean, I think NATO is uh, you know, invaluable. It's a good thing we've got it, not least because it puts clearly defined lines in the sand, and that makes life a lot easier. And it also makes life a lot easier for the Russians when they are working out what they can and cannot do. If the Russians had to look at Europe and work out which countries they could interfere with and which countries they couldn't, and they had to work that out themselves, then the odds of them making a cataclysmic error would quite possibly be a lot higher. Because to come back to Abigail's point, the First World War was not started by big countries. The First World War was a limited conflict in the Balkans that ran out of control. I mean, Jonathan's right. A non-state actor probably isn't necessarily going to start a Third World War, but it might destabilize a country or a region in a way that sucks in a bunch of other countries that then make mistakes. I mean, you can see this is where we're skirting around in Syria. Um, so I think NATO is, which is essentially a structure of Western democracies plus two in North America that say you'll go to war with all of us, you invade one of us is one of the very few clearly understood facts in the world, and I think that makes life a lot easier. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank all of you, too, for your excellent questions and for the seven points which have come out of today, which are very interesting. So let's <laughs> congratulate you. <laughs>